everyone, I'm Megan Ferdiber. And I'm Chris Urbanek. We are two primary care sports medicine physicians working out of East Carolina University in the Department of Family Medicine. This is going to be our AFP video series on basic examination and injection techniques for the foot and ankle. Whenever we approach a musculoskeletal examination, we do like to use the mnemonic IPASS, which stands for inspection, palpation, active passive range of motion, strength, and special tests. We're going to go ahead and get started and talk about the first part of that mnemonic, which is inspection and palpation. So when you're first evaluating your patient who's coming into the office with concern for foot or ankle injury, of course, one of the things that you want to evaluate for is, is there swelling? Is there bruising? Um, is there redness any place? Is there warmth any place? The next thing that you'll do, as long as your patient is able to do this for you, is you'll have your patient stand up and walk and evaluate their gait. As we inspect our patient, one of the things we want to make sure we do is evaluate their gait. A lot of times a patient's gait can actually contribute to some of their foot and ankle pain, especially if it's something that's chronic and long-standing. You also want to make sure that your patient can weight bear without too much difficulty. As your patient is evaluated walking, you want to evaluate whether or not they are pes planus or pes cavus, and you also want to see whether or not they overpronate or supinate during that gait pattern. So we just evaluated our model's gait here and we we're able to tell whether or not she is having pain in certain aspects of her gait whenever she's planting her feet. The other thing that we're able to evaluate is whether or not she has flat feet, which we like to call pes planus, or if she has a little bit more of a curve into her, into her longitudinal arch, which is called pes cavus. We also evaluate for overpronation and supination of the foot which is something that you can see very easily by watching somebody walk and watching somebody weight bear. Next, we're going to move on to the palpation aspect of our examination. And I'd like to first start up here at the head of the fibula. Whenever you're evaluating your patient with a foot and ankle injury, one of the first things that you want to do is you want to make sure that you palpate the head of the fibula. This is a common site for small little stress fractures and injuries, especially with folks who have had acute injuries to their ankle. What I then do is then I work my way down the leg. So I'll start palpating out through the tibia and the fibula, working my way down the whole way to the ankle. As I'm going down here, I'm looking for any areas that are particularly sore or painful. As I move down closer to the ankle, I ensure that I palpate around both the lateral and medial malleoli. Important reason for this is that there are a set of rules called the Ottawa Foot and Ankle Rules, and that is a guideline as to when you should get x-rays of somebody with an acute injury. Uh, and some of the key areas where somebody is experiencing pain, if they do have something like a stress fracture or stress injury, are at the medial and lateral malleoli. I'll also work my way down, if I'm coming laterally, down through the distribution of the peroneal tendons. You do have both peroneal longus and peroneus brevis. Peroneus longus does attach the whole way down to the base of the first metatarsal. Peroneus brevis attaches down to the base of the fifth metatarsal. I'll palpate down through their attachment points, and actually right here at the base of the fifth metatarsal, it's a common area where folks can develop stress fractures and is also a common landmark that is used in the Ottawa Foot and Ankle Guidelines to help guide the decision making on whether or not to get x-rays on a patient. I'll then palpate out through the tarsals and I'll get into the, the tarsal cuboid to ensure that there's no pain. And then I work my way down along each of the metatarsals to ensure that I'm not finding any of those areas that are particularly painful. And then I'll ask the patient to turn or I'll move around the patient so that I can get to the posterior aspect of the ankle and then further evaluate. Now we're going to focus on the palpation of the posterior aspect of the foot and ankle on our model. I'm going to go ahead and start talking about some of the areas that I commonly like to palpate. Coming down through the gastrocnemius muscle, palpating down through the myotendinous junction, and then to the part where the muscle becomes tendon or the Achilles tendon, and coming into that attachment point of the distal Achilles tendon onto the calcaneus. This can be a common site for something called insertional Achilles tendinopathy, which is very common. If I squeeze on either side of that Achilles tendon, there is a retrocalcaneal bursa that's there that could develop in some patients with repetitive injury, repetitive trauma to this area. And so that's why it's always important to palpate right in here. And then as I move my way down into the plantar aspect of the foot, I do like to palpate out toward that calcaneal fat pad or that heel fat pad. And then I'll palpate through there and coming down into the area of the calcaneus where you have the origin of the plantar fascia, as this is commonly associated, if somebody has pain here, can be commonly associated with plantar fasciitis or fasciosis. One of the areas we want to make sure not to neglect are going to be the areas of the distributions 
of the most common ligaments in the ankle. Laterally in the ankle here, we've got three big common ligaments, the ATFL, the CFL, and the PTFL. Now we're gonna move on to the palpation of the medial aspect of the foot and ankle. When we approach the medial aspect of the foot and ankle, we want to ensure that we palpate some key structures. One of these is the deltoid ligament, which lies here medially and is composed of multiple other smaller ligaments. We also want to ensure that we palpate down the tarsal tunnel. Now the tarsal tunnel consists of a few key structures, including the posterior tibialis tendon, the flexor digitorum tendon, and also the flexor hallucis longus tendon.